Everyone knows how important it is to keep their immune system as strong as possible, particularly coming into the cold and flu season. The guys over at Suns are always looking out for ways to help men with their health, and they have done it again with their new Ultimate Immune Health Supplement. It's formulated from 11 powerful ingredients and includes all the key vitamins, minerals and amino acids you need, like vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin B, zinc, larganine and the plant maca. All the things you can expect from a multivitamin. However, it's also got a special ingredient, a beta-glucan called Wellmune, which is clinically proven in 12 scientific trials. One trial in marathon runners led to a 40% reduction in respiratory infections. Another study showed a 71% reduction in the number of individuals reporting cold and flu symptoms. So if you're already taking a multivitamin or you're looking for something to strengthen your immune system this autumn winter season, then check out suns.co.uk and use the code WISDOM30 to get 30 pounds to get 30 pounds off your first order. It's the perfect supplement for fighting viruses, maintaining energy and hydration, as well as recovery from sport and weekend overindulgence. We've had uh, a few sent to the office and they taste pretty good. Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. If we're honest, we've not talked about actual cricket nearly as much as we'd like to over the past few weeks. And since last Thursday's pod, there have been further major developments in the Yorkshire racism scandal and we will cover those in detail later on in the show. Before we get there, there's a small matter of two World Cup semi-finals to talk about. Um, but if you want to head straight to our chat about Azim Rafiq, we'll leave a stamp, timestamp in the description. I'm Yaz Rana, and with me to discuss all that and more with me today is the magazine editor of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon, and features editor of Wisdom.com, Tar Hashim. Mark Butcher will be joining us over the phone later in the episode. Um, Joe, it's an exciting week. We'll also be previewing the 50th issue of the relaunched Wisdom Cricket Monthly and running through some of your, the listeners' favourite half centuries, which is exciting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We brought up our 50 this month. So it's uh, four years ago since we brought back Wisdom Cricket Monthly, which had existed, I think, since 1970. I write this down. Let me check. Don't want to get it wrong. 1979 to 2003. Uh, and yeah, we brought it back four years ago, just before an Ashes series, which we got very excited about, thought England were going to do pretty well, and then obviously did miserably. Um, so hopefully it's not the same thing again <laughs> this time. But um, yeah, a little little bat wave to get to yeah. our 50, but we're not done yet. We're, we're, we're kind of keep going, get to those three figures. Yeah, we'll, we'll get stuck into the latest issue. Um, Phil did talk about one particular feature quite in quite a lot of detail in last week's show, so we won't be talking about that again. <laughs> anyway, the T20 World Cup. We now have our four semi-finalists. England will face New Zealand at Abu Dhabi on Tuesday, while Pakistan take on Australia in Dubai on Wednesday. Um, I actually got a bit of stick from a friend of mine who listened to the pod about our T20 World Cup coverage the other day. He said that we've been a bit too critical of the competition and made what was actually a fair point that most cricket fans in the UK probably don't watch as much IPL as we do, so aren't as tired of cricket being held um, at, at fanless venues as, as we are, which I think is broadly fair, although I'd say the games still haven't been that good. Um, but let's start with a good game, that the England South Africa game on Saturday. It was England's first defeat of the tournament, uh, a rarely spotted high scoring thriller at this year's T20 World Cup. South Africa defended 189, winning by 10 runs. Rassi van der Dusen and Aidan Markham were brilliant at the back end of the South Africa innings, exposing England's death bowling in the absence of Mills for the first time this tournament. And uh, Kagiso Rabada took, I thought, one of the worst hat tricks I've ever seen. Um, Joe, how, how worried should England be about that defeat? Um, not especially. I don't think that defeat in itself, I mean, obviously, it, it literally didn't matter because England topped the group and South Africa went out. Um, but I do think there are concerns with the lineup. I mean, if you think now that they've lost Stokes, Archer, now, Roy and Mills, they've lost four of probably their best 11. Um, there's not many teams in the world who could who could do that and still win a world tournament. England obviously still can. They're in the semis. They would be marginal favourites to beat New Zealand, I think. But it's odd. I think Roy is a massive loss because of what he brings to the side. But I'm actually more concerned about the Mills uh, absence because I think Besto, uh, it remains to be seen what England will do, but I would certainly move Besto up to open. He's had a quiet tournament in the middle order. Um, you know, he's a brilliant white ball opener. He will be absolutely gagging to get a proper opportunity. He'd love to come out and take on the new ball. 
Um, we've seen in World Cups before when England were, were up against it. Um, he's, he's stepped in, scored those twin centuries against New Zealand, India. I think he's, he's kind of a big match player in white ball cricket who would love that responsibility. So by moving him, you weaken the middle order a bit. Billings for Bairstow essentially in the middle order, that is, that is slightly weakening it. But I'm not too worried about England against the new ball. I think they'll go well. The issue is is Mills because he does things that England's other bowlers don't do and Wood has got lots of um, admirable qualities uh, and on his day can be very dangerous in T20 cricket but he can also go the distance as we saw against South Africa and there is now a gap. There's no clear death bowler to operate alongside Jordan. Wokes kind of bowled in the sort of pre-death overs and was expensive. Wood was very expensive um, and that is an issue and that you know New Zealand will be a tactically astute very smart side. They will be looking at that area of England and thinking that's that's definitely a weakness that we can exploit. Mm. Ty, what do you think? Yeah, I was kind of thinking. I mean, Mills, you know, it, replacing him is is complicated in in number number of ways because when Mark Wood's obviously not a like for like replacement. If you're thinking like for like replacement, you're probably looking at Tom Curran. But Curran's obviously had you know had a pretty tough time for for quite a few years now, really. Um, and I was kind of looking at the way you could kind of get around it but it's especially with with that number seven slot in terms of you know that the question is whether you go for you know a batting heavy approach or a bowling heavy approach and England's number seven has had one run out in this tournament I think again against South Africa in that loss um so I almost thought you could kind of you could kind of get away with adding just another bowler there so you've you can kind of ease that load and, and Karin could fit that Willie could fit that but then Willie's also more of a power play guy he's not really solving your death issue so there's so many ways you can kind of complicate the selections around it um look the the way England will probably go is you know move Besto up bring Billings in um you I went for Vince right huh you went for Vince so yeah, yeah I kind of you know I had all these questions going around in my head and I thought why don't you just go play it simple go for the straight swap Vince in for Roy I think I rate James Vince more than I rate Sam Billings. Um, I think for all the players that are available for England right there, I think if you put in Vince for Roy, I think that is probably the, and made no other changes, I think that's probably the strongest 11 England put, can put out. And I think that counts a lot in a World Cup semi-final. Um, it is quite easy to, you know, go and overcomplicate things in T20. And I'm sure I'll get accused of oversimplifying the matter, but in a World Cup semi-final when everything's on the line, why not just <laughs> play your 11 best players? And I think, personally, that's that's those are the 11 best players I would see if you just swap um, Vince for Roy from the, from the team that played South Africa. I take your point there, but it's interesting when you talk about the best 11, and that might be true. Maybe, on balance, I think Vince is a better player than Billings, but isn't it about having your best players in the roles where they can most affect the game in T20? So if you're talking about Billings at seven or Vince opening or Bairstow at four and Bairstow opening getting Bairstow involved feels much more important to me than than keeping the the, the rest mm. of the side the same I really like Bairstow in the middle I think I think from an opposition's point of view if I looked at the England lineup I would I would always want Bairstow at the top because you'd feel like with a new ball you could in theory the new ball get England's two best batters out early and that's a completely different game with a slightly weaker middle order but I think with England I mean, another option that we're not mentioned yet is potentially Livingston opening um, and bringing Billings into the middle order. Livingston's opened a lot in domestic T20 cricket around the world. I'd probably go Milan up top. I think looking specifically at New Zealand, um, New Zealand's probably biggest strength of the ball is, is Salvi and Bolt up top. And if, if in New Zealand win the game, I think they'll have to take two or three wickets in the power play. Power play, Tal, you made the point in the office yesterday that we haven't actually haven't had that many high scoring power plays in the tournament. Um, and I think Milan up top would, it would do a, a fine job there. And then I would bring in Billings in the middle order. And I think basically because of what you were saying earlier, there isn't a, a simple way of replacing Mills. So I think that I think it therefore makes sense to, to go batting heavy. If you just acknowledge, even if you go bowling heavy, you probably actually aren't replacing Mills anyway. And you might um, get lucky. I mean, even if Wood does bowl two expensive overs, but, Livingston goes okay, then Wood doesn't have to bowl his full his full quota as well. But then you do have that who bowls the death overs. My, my concern, I think Milan up top makes some sense, but my concern would be that Milan would get bogged down, therefore putting pressure on Butler to play in a way. The great thing about Butler is he 
plays so differently depending on the situation, depending on how sometimes he does look a little bit bogged down for 10, 15 balls. My concern is that he would need to kind of hit his way out of that if he's alongside Milan, who isn't really going to go better than a runner ball for the first couple of overs, really. Uh, and so much hinges on Butler. I mean, if you look at how England's partly through lack of opportunity, they haven't been chasing a lot of runs a lot of the time, but it feels to me like this. It's so much of this hinges around what Butler can do in these two big games yeah. if they get two games. Yeah, I, I mean, I should say on Vince, um, you know, part of it. So we obviously did a piece for for Wisdom dot com yesterday. You know, picking our 11s and part of the reason I also chose Vince is just I'm still sort of enamoured by the story. You're, su- um, you're a sucker for the romance. Yeah, aren't exactly. You? So and, you know, he's you know he came out of nowhere in the summer and you know finally got that international century against Pakistan I thought we all agreed that was the best way for him to sign off though. <laughs> now you want to bring yeah. him back and spoil it is it well he's also had like a, a really good year in, in T20 cricket I think he's won so he's won the BBL you know played a leading role in that um, played a bit of a part in the PSL uh, winning win, winning that competition with, with Multan uh, then won the 100 as well and he's just a nearly he's won a, the blast he's a very, as well huh? nearly won the blast as well yeah, and he's just a very good T20 opener. And, you know, I'm also a sucker for him kind of almost righting the wrongs of 2019. He obviously replaced Roy in that tournament. It really didn't come off. Um, and maybe in T20 when you're, you know, you're you're not clutching to too much theory and you're just going to go out there and, you know, give it a whack in the power play and 22 off 12 is is a is a great innings. Maybe that's that's where James Vince comes alive. And I think that's <laughs> sends, a really good point. Sending them through to I think that's a really good point on making too much out of the three failures in 2019. I think it, it's a it's a different format, and I think to to basically disregard someone's worth in in a World Cup based on just three innings, I think is a bit harsh. Um, the the other thing that when we were picking our team to Wisdom.com yesterday, I, I was the only person to pick Reese Topley. Um, I don't think he'll actually play because he's come in as a replacement reasonably late on, but. If you're looking for, a, the, I think he's the best death bowler who England have available to them and also left arm angle, vary the attack up a little bit. And I was thinking if if I wanted anyone in that squad to bowl two overs alongside Jordan in the end, it probably would be Topley. Um, and I think it's worth saying on Wood, by the way, there'll be some people listening to this thinking, hang on, wasn't he England's best bowler early in the year against India? The difference was he was bowling up front, he was bowling in the power play, he was bowling in the first half and in innings. And right now that's what Wokes is doing. So and Wokes is doing that job very well for England at the moment, the World Cup. So um, he could come on earlier though, couldn't he? Even if he doesn't take the new ball. That's South, true. South Africa game. What he what, didn't bowl until was it the eleventh over? Or the, the I think so. Over? Yeah, I think so. So I would obviously there are matchups to be taken into account, and it depends which wickets go go early. But I would certainly want to get a couple of woods overs done in the first mm. in the first, in the power play really. Yeah. Um, and, and also that yeah that, that could happen Wood is also worth saying he took a fourth for against New Zealand in the warm-up game as well so uh, it's a bold call to, to leave him out I think part of picking Wood is because he's Mark Wood do you know what I mean like if you thought about it logically you know if, if England were going to replace Small Mills and having had the success they'd had without Mark Wood um, you know earlier in the tournament they could have just gone against South Africa they could have just gone Curran and that kind of fits the bill kind of perfectly in terms of the role Mills would play but because he's Mark Wood he's got a record behind him he's he's done a lot of great things for England and he's really really fast mm. you know there's just that that sort of fear factor that that's there regardless of when whenever he's going to bowl and that's, came, yeah that's yeah. good point. I'm thinking if, if I was an England player and I was walking out in a World Cup semi-final who would yeah. I want to be walking out exactly. alongside me and it would be mm. of, of those options it would be Wood by a, a, by a distance and also against South Africa, he just came against. He came up against two batters who were just brilliant against pace. I mean, there's that famous Markham shot against Mitchell Stark those, those few years ago. But Markham and Van Dusen brilliant against high pace, and he didn't really get an opportunity to bowl against anyone else. And you'd think New Zealand looking at their lineup, it's probably not quite as strong as, as South Africa's. Um, by the way, my moment of the week was from this game. It was watching uh, the England run chase in the bar after my cricket club's golf day. And uh, just the rare experience of watch of, of watching a cricket match with twenty people who are similarly invested as you are was really good fun. And this is what um, Sunday could be. This yeah. is no Premier League football on. Um, I don't know if England are playing an international that no one cares about on the Bob, Sunday afternoon. Bobbly. I don't know. They're playing San Marino, I think. Are they? <laughs> like some you point said, the weekend. no one cares about it. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's a real it's a real opportunity here. So let's just fingers crossed they can. Um, I mean, this is all very much England centric, isn't it? Mm. We're a bit more bit more global than that, but. <laughs> From an English perspective, it'd be great if they can get through and, and make it a proper cricket day on Sunday. Mm, absolutely. Um, 
We've got a, we've got a lovely email sent in from Chris in Vietnam. Uh, not sure if you'll get this in time for this week's podcast, but just want to say thank you for your fantastic podcast. There are a lot of cricket podcasts out there, but yours is the only one I listen to pretty much every week, and last week was a reminder why. Firstly, the reflections on the latest Azim Rafiq news were astonishingly honest and heartfelt and incredible to listen to. However, if that wasn't enough, Taha on the difference between England's players in red and white ball cricket and Phil on Hasiba Mead were both wonderful to listen to as well. While I'm writing in, here's a question for you about the T20 World Cup. Um, do you think England's white ball excellence is enough to justify them prioritising white ball cricket ahead of tests? Um, thanks for that lovely email, Chris, but I think that's a really good question as well. Um, England could be about to become the first country to win, to, to hold both World Cup, white ball World Cups at the same time in men's cricket um, whilst missing half their first team. That would be an incredible achievement. Um, can I, you kind of, kind of understand why you'd prioritise white ball cricket if you're that good at it. Yeah. I mean, in, simply put, in, in um, answer to Chris's question, I would say no. Uh, I would say in the past, test cricket has been prioritised and white ball cricket has got lost and that obviously got fixed and under Morgan's reign and England won a World Cup and could win a second World Cup. So I think it's about finding a balance and, and you know, that's a, a boring answer. But I, I think if we start prioritising white ball cricket over red ball cricket, uh, you're going to lose a lot of people who are the bedrock of cricket fans in this country. That Test cricket matters more to them. There will still be a decent chunk of England fans who might tune in to watch your game in the C20 World Cup, but broadly don't care about it. Um, Test cricket also makes a lot of money in this country for, for the ECB. Um, so you don't want England to start losing as many matches as they have been recently. Um, and also, England's Test side is a constant frustration because... They're not especially good, but at times they are quite good and they've certainly got some really good players. So there's still a sense that this England team could be much better than it is if, you, if they can fill a, I mean, you know, a top three would be, would be handy. A good start. <laughs> yeah. But there is still, we are still talking about some players within this test side who are the best players, some of the best players I've ever seen play for England. So there is no reason why they shouldn't be a good team. And if you start tilting too far towards white ball cricket, the whole thing just gets shot. And also, players start making their decisions based on those prioritisations as well, which is a very dangerous road to go down. Mm. As we mentioned before, many, many times this, this year, England haven't really played their best side in Test cricket, which is something that... Well, you can argue they already are doing exactly what Chris has yeah, said, basically. exactly, exactly. Um, anyway, here's Butch on England's progression to the semi-finals and India's failure to make it there. Um, Butch... Owen Morgan is stuck by Jason Roy uh, through periods of bad form. He's very much one of Owen Morgan's most trusted men in this team. He's out of the tournament. How, how would you go about replacing Roy? Well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a shocker, isn't it? Um, I noticed actually a couple of days ago or in the aftermath of the, um, of, of the, the loss to South Africa that um, there was something online from, I think, one of the, the fitness guys in the England team talking about their fitness regime and how, you know, they're, they're sort of, their power sessions, their power up sessions in the lead up to games and everything means they're the, the fittest and strongest team in the competition. I thought the timing was kind of, was a little, <laughs> could have been a little bit better given that they've lost two players now, two key players um, in, in the tournament during the, during matches. So, um, you know, we, maybe we should just send a little note to, to whoever that fitness guy was and say, maybe you should tone it down a bit so they can get it through, get through games. Um, replacing him is not going to be straightforward. Um, I mean, the, the easiest like for like replacement would be James Vince, wouldn't it? You have him have him come in at the top of the order. He's a fabulous player. Um, coming in sort of very very cold at this late stage of the tournament will be difficult for him. Um, he had to do it, didn't he, in the uh, in the World Cup and and didn't make much of a splash there. Um, I suppose the other way to look at it is that England have had um, haven't really had to use their batting resources um, too much in the in the tournament so far. So you could say, well, Liam Leaving for Livingston opens. And does so with uh, with with great um, aplomb um, when playing in the hundred this year and playing for for Lanks. So he could go up the order, um, and you might perhaps then decide to go with somebody like David Willey, um, give you an all round option, um, which might be handy given that Mark Wood I don't think is any sort of replacement for Tamar Mills. Um, you know we saw him go around the park in the match against South Africa, so Owen might want to have a little bit of cover for him. Um, but having said that, you know, he didn't use Livingston in that match either um, against South Africa, which I thought was, was bizarre, unless it was one of you know, Owen's little 
well, let's see if we can do without this and see if we, we need to get Mark Wood through four overs in this match. It doesn't matter really as long as we don't lose too heavily. Um, you know, let's, let's see what we can do without use going to, to Livingston's part-time stuff. So England, whatever they do, have got plenty of options. I, I think as I'm talking, I'm leaning towards bringing in David Willey, the all-rounder, another bowling option for him, um, uh, the left arm angle, all of those all of those, uh, <laughs> all of those cliches um, and bumping Livingston up to the top of the order and sort of replacing Roy's power with, uh, with even more power from, from leaving Liam Livingston. That's probably the way I'd go. Mm. Um, you mentioned it. There's no, no Stokes, there's no Archer, no Sam Curran, no Jason Roy, no Tamar Mills. How big an achievement would this be if England managed to win the whole thing and become the first men's side to hold both World Cup trophies? Yeah, it would be it would be extraordinary. I mean, I still they're still favourites, aren't they? I mean, they're kind of that 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 tag has perhaps been tarnished slightly with the injuries, but um, even without the names you'd mentioned, if if Roy and, and Mills had both stayed fit, then they're still a fabulous, fabulous team. Um, but it's just been made that little bit more difficult now, hasn't it? Um, and you know, we'll see England pride themselves on the amount of depth that they have. Um, and the players that are, that are sort of sitting out and, you know, the boasts have been made, not by the England team, it has to be said, that, that they could put out two teams in white ball cricket and be equally as strong as one another. But well, we're about to find out. Mm. Um, on India, what do you think went wrong for them? They've not won a T20 World Cup since the advent of the IPL. And, and this time mm. they, didn't, they didn't come close. Come no. by both Pakistan and New Zealand. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they look like they're playing a sort of a, a slightly old-fashioned version of the game. Um, in that, uh, you know, some of the some of their younger and more exciting players from the from the IPL don't seem to be able to get a look in in front of the uh, the more established guard. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a good chance that they're kind of running on empty a little bit after an extraordinary um, 18 months. Uh, it's probably not quite that long, but you know, they, they began winning down under in Australia, then came to England, the, the World Test Championship, been on the road and in bubbles for forever and ever. And I think Ravi Shastri um, mentioned that in his um, in his standing down statement that they were kind of, you know, they'd gone to the well that often that there just wasn't anything left um, come this uh, this T20 World Cup. But I think it, it, you know it's the timing of it is pretty good. You know, Kohli as captain has not been that successful in the white ball in the white ball game for them, particularly when you marry that up against the man that he's taken over from. Um, they'll get a bit of an injection there from uh, from a different bit of thinking at the top. Um, and also, of course, Shastri's gone as well, and uh, Raul Dravid will have a will have a look at um, bringing in some of the youth and exuberance that has that has sort of lit up the uh, the IPL over the last couple of years, and perhaps siphon off or, or you know sideline some of the old guard. Mm. Um, just just on watch, I'll read out what Shastri said. Um, he said, "I am mentally drained, but I expect that at my age. But these guys are physically and mentally drained." They spent six months in the bubble and we would have ideally liked a bigger gap between the IPL and the World Cup. It's when the big games come and the pressure hits you, you're not as switched on as you should be. It's not an excuse because we take defeat. We're not scared of losing. In trying to win, you lose games. But here we didn't try to win because the X factor was missing. I mean, obviously, when you go through that India side, there are so many star names there. It, it's it's yeah. obviously not in a semi-final. Do, do you think that that was the biggest factor in, in, their, in their failure, I guess? Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. I think so. I mean, it, the, the statement kind of could have ended after the after the sort of fatigue part and made and made perfect sense. I think the idea that they didn't try to win um, is perhaps lost in translation a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I, I totally I take it that that's a that's a valid excuse. Um, I, I also think that, um, that that it was a slightly veiled dig maybe at, at, at BCCI. I think saying I, we would have liked to have had a gap between the IPL and the World T20 is something that's perhaps more under their control than it is anybody else's. And maybe that was a, a, veiled, a veiled dig at the powers that be um, there. But um, <laughs> the money monster has to be fed, doesn't it? So, mm. um, and they've, they've, they've perhaps paid for it. Who knows? You talked about um, in, in Kohli's captaincy coming to an end. Um, who do you think should replace him? Because a lot of people have just assumed it's going to be Rohit Sharma, but you also made a valid point that a lot of the, the really good young IPL stars, their pathway into the team is blocked by the more established names who've been around for a long time. Rohit Sharma is one of them. He's not had an incredible IPL for a very long time. He's, he's, uh, I guess he's got an old school um, approach to opening the batting in T20 cricket. Arguably, that's not much of a step forward if they go in that direction. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I mean, maybe, maybe the problem has been that sort of Rohit's, 
Rohit's sort of best years as a captain as, and as a player have been spent not captaining the team. And it might just be that he is, he's kind of um, getting to the end of his, his time as the sort of the dynamic T20 leader that Indian need. I, I, w- I would say he's probably got another couple of very, very good years left in him. But I suppose if you have the chance, the opportunity to look further forward than that, then you might go, OK, well, Rishabh Pant has done a terrific job um, with Delhi Capitals. The guy that he took over from, Shreyas Iyer, is also another, you know, a brilliant young um, ball striker, batsman. He's also captained the team extremely well. So there's a couple of names there from the same franchise, um, you know, who perhaps uh, perhaps might find themselves elevated. But of course, you know, you, you've also got the the the, the interesting um, the interesting dynamic that even though Coley is stepping down as captain, he's still going to be in the team, isn't he? I mean, he's still going to be there. He's still he's going to play. He's made him <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the same with Rohit. So, um, you know, whoever, whoever does take over as captain has got, some, has got some big decisions to make about how they want to, how they want to go forward, I suppose, in, in the format. Oh. Um, you know, it, it's a, there are going to be more T20 World Cups than there are of anything else. So arguably, it becomes the most important captaincy that there is to give out. And um, you marry that with the, the high profile nature of the IPL. And they've got to get it right, haven't they? Otherwise, people will be very, very upset. And there are millions of them. Well, over a million. Um, <laughs> yes. <and> finally, <laughs> while I've got you, do you want to pick out your two finalists? Um. Well, I, I'm worried about New Zealand as, as, a, as, a, as an Englishman, but I still think England should have enough to, to win that one. Um, so, I, of course, I'll go for England. Um, and, and the second semi final is, is very interesting because Pakistan are a monster of a team. And we flagged this up months ago that, that given everything else that was going on, um, you know, which seemingly up against Pakistan, people pulling out of tours and whatever that their likely response would be to go on and win the World T20. And uh, the way they've played so far, you, you can't say that we were, we were far off the mark. Um, they have every single base covered. In fact, some bases that you don't even think you need. Um, you know, you've got <laughs> Shoaib and Hafiz are st- still miraculously performing superbly. Neither of them have had to do a great deal of work as sort of backup bowlers, but they're there if, if, if required. Um, you know, Shaheen Shahafri, Harris, Ralph, um, Hassan Ali, Imad Wazim, Shadab Khan is a five foot that you'd, that you'd absolutely kill for um, as a bowling attack um, in, uh, in T20 cricket. And then you've got this Asif Ali, who's an absolute hooligan, um, uh, smoking, <laughs> smoking the ball out of the, part, out of the bottom. Um, Rizwan, the, biggest, the highest scorer in uh, T20 cricket in a calendar year ever. And Baba Azam, who's just one of, the, one of the great players, one of the fabulous players to watch. So they are a fabulous, fabulous team. Um, and as, you know, as for their opponents, Australia, I mean, that, you know, they'll say that they're peaking at the right time. Um, my feeling is, um, and, and my tongue could be in my cheek here, you'll have to work that out for yourself, but my feeling is that Shane Watson is the, is the most valuable player for uh, Australia at the moment. He's been excellent on commentary uh, in the World T20. Um, they've got, I mean, they've gone with a sort of test match bowling lineup that's done, that's done superbly. Hazelwood um, is just getting better and better as, as a white ball bowler to go along with the fact that he's awesome. Um, in the Red Bull game, um, you know, Zampa and Maxwell provide a, the, the, the sort of the change of pace for them. But I think in, in terms of their middle order, if, if, if you're Pakistan, you're looking at Australia in game, we get them three down in the first five or six overs, we've won the game. Because I'm not entirely sure that the that sort of the middle order, the middle to lower order batting of Australia can cope with what, uh, with, with what Pakistan's bowling line can throw at them through the rest of the inning. Mm. Interesting. Um, well, Butch, cheers your time and we'll see you soon. Um, on South Africa, they only just missed out on a place in the semi-finals, finishing level on points with England and Australia, but behind both on net run net run rate. They weren't they weren't really fancied that much before this tournament, but I, I thought they were, they were pretty good. De, De Kock, Van der Dusen, Mark and Miller, that's a good that's a good core of the batting, and then um Norkia and Rabada were were excellent. Um, and, and Pretorius, I thought, was really interesting because, you know, he comes on as their fifth bowler and you can see teams wanting to line him up. But he was very clever, I thought, kind of bowling as wide as you can legally bowl with the field set exactly for that. Um, Tar, we're, we're, we're picking out our breakout stars of the T20 World Cup and you kind of cheekily gone for Norkia, which I think is a bit of a cheat. <laughs> it, it is a bit of a cheat. Um, he's been around for a couple of years now in international cricket. Um, he's made a huge impression in the IPL with, <clears throat> with Delhi, I mean, he just bowls because, you know, the IPL website shows us those speeds. You know, he is he's kind of the, the quickest guy out there. Um, 
And I was I was really excited to watch him bowl in this tournament because I I like the fact that you know him and Rabada play in that Delhi side, um, and now they're going to do it together with South Africa in a World Cup. And Rabada's the guy who's been he's kind of been the main man for quite a long time for South Africa. But in this tournament, it felt like Nokia was the main guy, um, and he is just he's just frighteningly quick. It, it's really as simple as that. And you know he was borderline unplayable at times. I think he went under six and over in the tournament. Um, and he's just he's just exciting to watch. It's it really is just as simple as that. He's very quick, and that is a thrilling thing. I'm not talking, you know, there's 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 guys who who are quick and they'll bowl a few balls above 90 miles an hour, and then there are guys like Nokia who will kind of consistently do it. And then it's you you can tell immediately a, a, that a batter is feeling those extra miles, and and Nokia makes it very clear. And, He's just enjoyable to watch, and I'm just glad to see that he was, he was among the wickets. Mm, I remember when England went to South Africa a couple of winters ago. Kevin Peters in a commentary said about Nokia, there is just a point with the bowler when he bowls so quickly that even the very best batters, he's obviously referred to himself there, um, can no longer think. Basically, it's all instinct, and Nokia seems to be that. And you're right, he's the top of all the speed lists. Um, Joe, what what are your thoughts on net run rate? Ben's not here unfortunately this week because this is a very Ben question, um, but it, it did. Or almost dominate discussion going into a lot of games um and is, is that is that right especially in that second group and it didn't and then it didn't end up coming down to this but i kind of felt a team shouldn't qualify for a world cup semi-final because they've thrashed scotland or namibia slightly more than another team do you think that's something that the icc should look to change going into future editions if they keep the format as it is um I think so. I think there's been too much on it and it, it came into play too early. The way certain results went, we realised that there was going to be two or three teams competing for a spot and that net run rate was going to be crucial. And then teams just came out and obliterated the smaller nations, which I agree. I don't think that's the way things should be decided. I think I would rather it be done on just the, the result between the teams that are involved. So in that case, with South Africa and Australia, South Africa would have still gone out because Australia beat them. So it hasn't actually changed anything there. But it's just... It, it becomes a bit of a sideshow and I know Ben's got issues with how net run rate works anyway, right? I mean, I, I saw him tweeting something the other day. I mean, yeah, I, I, only, really I only pay it. vague attention. I really understand. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's not ideal. I think when Ben Jones was on, I think he was saying that the T20 World Cup after the next one is going to be four groups of four. Um, and in that sense, I mean, should that make net run, net run rate less... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think, yeah, I, I guess the thing, the difficulty with head to head is, so for England, South Africa, Australia, they all technically beat each other. I would have net run rate just for the games, including the teams who are on equal points. If that makes sense. So England thrashed Australia. So Australia would probably have been the team that would miss out in that instance. If that oh, I see sense. what you mean. And yeah, good point. I mean, I was saying South Africa would have <laughs> yeah. still gone out, but obviously they beat England. So they'd yeah. be tied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and also something that Ben Ben has said a few times is that when you have it as when you have net run rate over all games as the deciding factor, the fixture list actually makes quite a big difference. So Australia, for example, played Bangladesh who were already out, and then a West Indies team who, who were basically already out as well in their last two games. So playing two teams when they they've got nothing riding on it, when you need to win as by as much as possible is slightly unfair I think and I think that's that's kind of what I was trying to get at with the groups of six there are too many dead games too early for sides that actually the results are very important for other teams yeah. but they're kind of they've basically clocked off as the West Indies seem to have done um, um, yeah the interesting thing about the West Indies result is that the automatic qualification to the group stages of the next World Cup is based on the world rankings <laughs> so but the world rankings are quite hard to work out so that game for West Indies against Australia could actually potentially have cost West Indies a spot in the group stage at the next World Cup. It means that they'll have to go through the, the first round qualifying period. It does That's not set in stone yet. But um, it's almost a shame that wasn't made more clear because that would have been a, a very, very interesting thing to, to kind of be, to, to be watching if, if I'm not sure if the team was aware of it, to be honest, given how they played a lot of that game. Um, we'll get to West Indies in a bit more detail later. But, but Joe, England playing New Zealand in that first semi-final. Um, New Zealand have obviously been a very good 50 overside recently, but I think they went into this tournament under the radar a little bit. And, <laughs> they, and, they, and I guess with, with their group having two associates in it, they needed what, one very good performance against either Pakistan and India and they were basically through and that's what they did with the, with the win over, over India. How, how, what, what do you make of their chances? 
I mean, it's very difficult to talk about this New Zealand team in this tournament without resorting to cliches. I mean, you've already said <laughs> slipped under the radar. Uh, and it has been a great team effort Dark without horses. any individuals necessarily starring. And, but, but, but it is true. And when you, it kind of needs to be with this. As you say, in 50 over cricket, they've got a, a really well-drilled side that fits that format. I think T20, they, they haven't necessarily got T20 stars. Um, but... But it pretty much everyone's performed in their in their squad. I suppose Trent Bolt has been the star performer. But if you look through their batting, I think everyone's had a had a decent knock. Yeah. Um, Gupta, who I thought kind of lazily was a bit of a spent force, seems to have seems to have come good. I've always really liked him as a cricketer, so that's good to see him coming through. They're still really dangerous. I mean, I, I said England's slight favourites, but I'm I'm talking fifty five, forty five. Really, I, I think it's particularly when we we throw in the toss and the importance of the toss. Uh, if New Zealand win the toss, then perhaps New Zealand become marginal favourites, or it's a fifty-fifty game. But it's but it's a really really tight one to call, and it'll probably go to a super over. I imagine <laughs> they always uh, punch above their weight, don't they? They do, Tar. They do. Very yeah. insightful. <laughs> they, they've uh, I've, been, I've been impressed, but basically all of their bowlers have done well. I think all of their bowlers using the tournament have gone at less than seven point five and over. I think. I suppose their their spinners are worth talking about actually because. I certainly wrote in our preview, which was wildly wrong on on, on most fronts. <laughs> Although Ben Jones did do the predictions of where teams should finish, I feel I should give him that one. Um, but I I did write that that New Zealand's lack of a world class spinner um, would hold them back in this tournament, and it and it hasn't really. Sodi's bowled really well and bowls aggressively, takes wickets. Santner, I know he went for a few in the last game, but has, has been very very tidy as well and it's it's again it's a kind of quite a, a functional spin department but but it seems to be doing doing the job quite well um i don't know if other teams have necessarily targeted their, their spinners and in, in as aggressively as they could have done it'd be interesting to see how england go about playing their spinners um because I, I still do think even though they've done well i think that is a weakness to exploit particularly you don't necessarily want to go too hard at bolt early up because you know you could be two three wickets down mm. and, and the game could be almost gone mm. Absolutely, and, and England have got players you think actually quite well suited to take down their spinners as well. Moeen Morgan in the middle, you think you kind of want England to hold them back, and Bairstow as well, all very good hits of spin, uh, so that could be quite interesting. Um, Tar, Pakistan are the only team to be five from five. Um, they are a lot of people's favourites. Are they? Are they yours? Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh no, I do, <clears throat> I do, I do sort of hold on to my theory that you, you got to lose one in the group stage. You got, you got to have a loss somewhere, you know. Um, and so I don't think a team has ever won a T Twenty World Cup winning every single game. By the way, right? So yeah, so they're doomed. So yeah, they, they are doomed. <laughs> but uh, I mean, the dream is the dream is a England Pakistan final. Um, they've been for me the two best teams in the tournament, and so uh, it'd be great to see that. Like I said last week, it'd be great to see Shaheen open up uh, against Josh Butler. But yeah, Pakistan. I kind of, <laughs> it's weird. I've kind of, um, you know, was very heavily invested in them in the start. And then after, you know, their first three wins, it's like, oh, they're through and haven't paid as close attention since. But then even in those games against uh, Scotland and Namibia, they had sort of, you know, kind of everyone's kind of stepping up, you know. So Shoe Malik, who's, who, was, who, had, who played a few decent knocks earlier in the tournament, he then has his moment where he smacks, what, 54 of 18 balls against Scotland. Um, and so, you know, Babar Azam has been sort of the, the consistent player getting runs every match, but along alongside him, everyone's kind of clinging on. So in the first match, you know, Shaheen and Rizwan do the job, then Harris Raf and, you know, Asif Ali come to the fore. And so everyone's kind of riding the wave. Everyone's sort of joining along and it's just coming together really nicely for them. But then what is it? Pakistan, Australia, T20 World Cup semi-final. 2010 you can't you can't help but think of that you know they were they were there and then Mike Hussey came and smashed what 60 something or 20 something um so that's uh that's the, that's the stumbling lot but um look I'd be I'd be pretty surprised if they don't beat Australia I just think they're they're a better side and yeah, that's really I think the most that. concerning thing from a Pakistan perspective is that I'm absolutely confident they'll win and don't see a slip up at this stage there's something quite un-Pakistan like about them and that, that that it's a very well organized side with very clearly defined roles and it all flows from Bubba up top who you just know is going to score runs basically um which i wasn't really aware of we saw signs of it when they were over here in england that the, the kind of pieces of the jigsaw were being put together 
But their success in world tournaments previously has kind of come out of nowhere and it, it's potentially reliant on some kind of individual efforts rather than a like clearly honed team. But especially when you think they... I mean, they still don't have like a permanent coaching staff, do yeah, they? Yeah, and ev- everything seems too perfect. You know, they've got their social media crews, you know, parading the, you know, going through the dressing rooms, filming them after every game, it's having lots like, of cake, having, having ca- cake, chatting with the other team. It's like they're like they're they're great off on the field. They're like the nicest guys off it, and it's just like what what's no something something has to be wrong here. Something has to be right. And, and just, yeah, Matthew Hayden's the, the Matthew Hayden as well. Looks what like this like on? this great father figure who's just like encouraging everyone. Philander's having a great time. Just is Sack Lane as well. There's a video of Sack Lane bowling to Baba on the nets. You know what, what, a, what an amazing coaching trio that I is. Just Philander, kinda, Hayden, and, and Sack Lane. It, it, it was a game between the coaching staff <laughs> at the C20 <laughs> World Cup. I think South Africa. I'm oh, sorry, would, Pakistan were doing pretty well. It would probably be like the most boring one of those amazon prime documentaries because like just everything's nice and rosy and nothing's yeah. nothing's nothing bad's happening yeah as yeah. i said a few weeks ago after they beat india they've got this kind of got a really interesting squad dynamic where they have that young new core who've never played a t20 world cup but a game between them with rizwan baba shaheen shadab really but you've also got the presence of the oldies there hafiz malik and safraz yeah. carrying the drinks um it's quite an interesting <laughs> dynamic to yeah. have there but the, the new core leading the way they've got their way of playing but they've also got the experience there to just calm things down a little bit as well i think so it's a really interesting dynamic um perhaps good news for pakistan fans i, I think australia will beat pakistan um <laughs> They obviously demolished West Indies in that very strange final Super 12 game. Um, you see the near farcical ending where Gale dismissed Mitchell Marsh and then kind of celebrated with Marsh with Australia needing like one more <laughs> run to win. Uh, they, they were another team that weren't really talked about much going into the tournament. And I think that's possibly to do with how familiar their 11 is to a lot of us. And also maybe because of the lack of form Warner had, he had a very bad IPL, was dropped, etc. But I feel like if Warner's, Warner's in the runs again, that completely changed the Australia team. He's right up there with one of the best T20 players in the world when he's on song. And it's not been that long since he was that. And if he has just turned it on, I feel that's, that's quite dangerous for everyone I else. get what you mean about kind of finding it hard to be excited about them because we know all their players but they've never really had a stable lineup mm. and like <coughs> they're not really a great t20 outfit i mean they've you know they've lost most of their last series um, there's always been a sense they haven't taken it that seriously as yeah. well i think that's part of the reason why we didn't necessarily tip them because they hadn't really tipped themselves it felt like this was just the kind of a thing to get through before the ashes arrive, and then they could yeah. dump England five 0 and start <laughs> celebrating. <laughs> They've got their test line up there, just warming up. Yeah, you know, exactly. yeah. yeah, but I guess it's also quite interesting though, that out of Australia at the semi-finals, Australia, New Zealand, Pakistan play T Twenty in quite an old school way. They don't try and get they don't, they don't go crazy from ball one, other than England really. Um, they've got better bowling attacks and batting lineups, and they kind of just try to get to par and back themselves to defend that, which is quite interesting and very different to what we've seen following England for the last few years where England is trying like, right, let's get as many as you possibly can. Um, I guess that's interesting. I'm not sure what you can really take from that. I don't really know why that's I the case. I guess we'll know as of Sunday <laughs> evening what we take from that. <laughs> that's true. That is true. Um, on West Indies, it, it feels a little bit like the end of an era for them. Uh, Bravo announced his retirement from international cricket. We're not quite sure what Gail's doing, but <laughs> he's 42 and <laughs> looked like he was calling it a day at the end of his game against Australia. Um, they've been absolutely crucial in their rise um, over the last few years. Arguably the first great international T20 side. Cricket was analyst Freddie Wild made the point on Twitter that their failure actually highlights just how good their bowling was when they were the best side in the world. When you had Bravo at his very peak, Samuel Badri, Sinul Narine. Um Yeah, it was quite quite sad that, that was that was the way their tournament ended. Kind of wanted them to do a bit a bit more. Um, going through a couple of the other teams. Um, on Bangladesh, they were ranked six before the tournament. They had a bit of a shocker, losing six matches at the tournament overall. Um, I'm going to read out this quote from Shakib before the tournament. So if you remember, Bangladesh did very well before the tournament. They beat Australia and New Zealand in home by an actual series uh, on, on not particularly great wickets. And Shakib said, uh, those who played in these l- last nine to ten matches are almost all out of form. Uh, that is how the wickets were and no one did that well. It's better not to read too much in these performances. If any batsman plays 10 to 15 matches on these wickets, their careers will be destroyed. Um, oddly prescient, I thought, <laughs> given that they, their, their lack of power across the tournament. Their um, lack of power really stands out, doesn't it? I know Pakistan have, have struggled with this a bit in the last few years, but 
seem to have really solved that of late. Bangladesh just don't have that their power. It's naturally, I can't remember what the game was it against England, where actually the players that m- looked most likely to clear the ropes were there like 8, 9, 10. Um, and I don't know if that's getting the tactics wrong or they just simply don't have the players to clear the ropes in the way that they should. They also looked very tentative, I thought, as well. But then again, perhaps that's a product of the fact that that is the way that they have to play because they're realistically not going to hit a huge amount of sixes. But yeah, you kind of felt like their bowling and particularly their spin bowlers might kind of carry them through, not necessarily to a semi-final, but potentially put them in contention for a semi-final. Um, but it, it, even when their bowlers did perform, they just didn't have the runs on the board to be in any way competitive, yeah. really. Shaqib's injury, in, injury towards the end didn't help. Um, Mustafizu didn't actually have that great a tournament given that he was supposedly in pretty good form coming into it um, thought Taskin looked pretty good at periods like he was hyped quite a few years ago uh, but thought he looked pretty good at stages um, and just on Afghanistan um, it's quite interesting because obviously a, a few of their players are, are really well known in T20 leagues around the world um, I feel like they're, they're batting is just not it's not quite quite there and I think for them to get to a semi-final, they'll need to discover one or two batters or maybe two, a couple of their younger players need to really take a few steps forward in their development. And one thing I think is quite interesting is how they use Rashid Khan, both with the bat and the ball. Um, he batted at number eight and only faced eight balls in the tournament. Um, and he's got like a, a genuinely brilliant strike rate batting at the death. And given that their problem is like a lack of power in the middle order in particular, obviously Najibullah Bullah had a good tournament. He got a couple of half centuries. But I feel that... It's just, a, it's just a missed opportunity. You might as well have a go with Rashid. I think he's only batted in the top seven twice for Afghanistan in T20 cricket, which I think, yeah, it's not, not great. And he also with the ball, they, they'd save him. I, I get the, the plan if they're defending a, a score like 150, 160, but when they're defending low totals, surely get Rashid Khan on early. That's that's, your, that's the way you're going to win a game. Um, almost too regimented in their approach. I, I completely agree on the batting, on his batting, because... It was the T20 Blast quarterfinal, wasn't it? Where he, he smashed, what, 20 off 10 balls yeah. or maybe even better strike rate than that. And it did kind of feel like he's wasted in a lot of the cricket I see, whether it's in the 100 or whether it's T20 Blast and certainly with Afghanistan. You think he should be, he should be floating really, yeah. but he just never seems to to come in. And he certainly, I think he was asked about in one of those, maybe it's after the Sussex innings or maybe after 100 knock, he was asked about, is, does he consider himself an all-rounder? And he was like, I absolutely consider myself an all-rounder, but no one else does. <laughs> Which it seems to be absolutely the case with um, with the Afghanistan uh, team. Cause they, just, they just don't use him. So the problem is that he's that good at bowling, but it's, you know, there is still a massive gap between his bowling and his batting yeah. because he's that good at yeah. his bowling. You know? yeah. um, on, on the breakout players of the tournament, Joe, we both picked Tranka players. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Yeah, mine was uh, Winandu Hasaranga, their leg spinning all rounder. So he took sixteen wickets across the the, the qualifying phase and the the main Super Twelves, which is the T Twenty World Cup records. I remember probably about a year ago Ben saying on this podcast that he'd heard Mickey Arthur saying that Hasaranga was going to be one of the best cricketers in the world, and I was a bit dismissive because I have to admit I hadn't heard of him at that point. I think Mickey Arthur said at that point was in the top ten most valuable players in the world. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well then, it's perhaps reasonable to be dismissive. But fast forward a year, and he is absolutely one of the best T Twenty players in the world. I mean, his his bowling is just built for the format, uh, and he smashes it. Uh, he scored. Well, he kind of kept Sri Lanka in that game against England briefly. It was his dismissal that suddenly it just it was clearly going to be an England win. But at one stage they were in the mix. Uh, he played a great knock against Ireland. I was just thinking now. If, you, if you're thinking, I know he got an IPL gig for the kind of the second phase of the IPL. But if 100 franchises are looking for whether he's available, he must be right up there with Rashid Khan as one of your top picks for the 100. And, and it led me to think. I don't know why there are so few Sri Lankans in county cricket over the years. Um, certainly over the last 10 years. And you might say Sri Lanka hasn't had that many kind of top players, but they've had a, they've had a few, certainly good enough to do a job in, in, in T20 cricket over here. Uh, so I'd be amazed if he hasn't been snapped up for the blast and the 100 and being one of the very top picks. Mm, absolutely. My, my pick's uh, Chari Thasalanka, who wasn't even in their side at the start of the tournament. Um, he, he was a complete revelation, such a clean ball striker. Lovely to and, watch. And yeah. we were saying this before we started recording that Sri Lanka, in a way, are the team of the tournament in terms of bringing some excitement. Players who we haven't really seen do it before on a massive global stage. Um, Tikshana, the, the mystery spinner, was very good as well. Um, you can kind of, you know, a lot of people were very down about the prospects of Sri Lanka cricket over the next few years, but there's, there are a lot of reasons for optimism after this tournament. And you can, and you can see them 
um, you know, causing a few upset, upsets in, in future tournaments. Um, and also sure. thinking some of it, not necessarily, I mean, Hasaranga, I know he's played a handful of tests without much luck so far, but it'd be interesting to see how that goes. But more importantly, when it comes to test cricket, seeing two genuine quicks um, in Chimera and Kamara, um, who were both upwards of 90 miles an hour, and they went distance at times in the T20 World Cup, but thinking test cricket, if, they've, if those two can, can stay fit and can get through days of test cricket, that is hugely exciting for Sri Lanka and just great for Test cricket in general because we need a good Sri Lankan Test side, just like we need a good West Indies Test side for variety and for just for kind of depth of talent. Absolutely, um, our, our weekly Mark Watt slot. So uh, he <laughs> didn't go quite. As... <coughs> Matt Parkinson's going to start getting jealous, yeah. you know. They're, yeah, they're actually quite a good mate. From they? Um, <laughs> of course uh, they are. <laughs> Mark Watt didn't go quite as well in his, his final couple of games against Pakistan and India, but he has secured a. A, a gig in the Abu Dhabi T10 league, so so well done, Mark. Um, <laughs> you kind of make it sound like you sorted that out for him. Were you involved in any? Uh, no, unfortunately not. <laughs> um, as mentioned at the top, we've had a few developments in the Azim Rafiq story since we last recorded the pod uh, on on Thursday evening. Uh, Michael Vaughan revealed that he is one of the former Yorkshire players named in the Yorkshire report into Rafiq's claims of racist abuse at the club. Vaughan categorically denied the claim that he told three players of Asian descent that there were too many of you lot. We need to do something about it before a county match in Nottingham. Uh, Former Pakistan bowler Rana Naveed Ul-Hassan said that he remembers Vaughan making those comments. Um, It's also been reported that another former Yorkshire player has made accusations of racism from his time at the club, while a former academy player, Irfan Amjad, claimed yesterday to the BBC that he was racially abused by a member of staff when he was 16. Also on Thursday, the ECB suspended Yorkshire from hosting England international fixtures and major matches. That includes the 100 and has threatened the club with further punishment after finding their handling of Rafiq's allegations of racism as wholly unacceptable. Uh, Chair Roger Hutton resigned and has since been replaced by Lord Patel. Um, Taha, he gave a very long press conference yesterday. What were your impressions of that? Um, well, immediately with, with Lord Patel... Um, when I saw the announcement uh, last Friday, I think I thought it's it's a really good appointment. Um, just a little bit of backstory on Lord Patel. He's born in Kenya, 1960. Um, arrived in Bradford uh, as a baby. It's it's where he's grown up. Um, it's where he first hand experience experience racism first hand. Uh, growing up, um, you know, he said this in his press conference. You know that as a kid he was a he's a really good runner because he had to run away from from the skinheads who were trying to beat him up. Um, he's seen how Yorkshire in the 20th century um, was a club that, that alienated people through through its birthright policy, where you had to be born in the county to play for it and, and for South Asians um, in those communities to, to play amongst themselves. Um, so he's seen the whole story progress to what it is today. And what we're seeing is Yorkshire in the 21st century um, and a club that still sort of an, is an alienating presence. Um, and look, so because he's he's been on that road, because he's been on that journey, um, look, I imagine that counts for a lot when you've got to when you've been tasked with sort of cleaning up this mess and, and taking the club forward, um, because his heart's in it, really. Um, I thought I thought that presser was a pretty good step forward. He'd only been in the job for a couple of days, really. Um, he delivered, you know, first up, he really delivered a, a sincere apology to Azim Rafiq. I mean, you could. You could sense it when you watched it. Um, it was powerful. It was heartfelt. Uh, made it clear that he'd spoken to Rafiq for several hours and actually listened to him. And that's what the last year has kind of shown us, that people haven't reached out to Rafiq and listened to him. And and that the, the club just didn't do that. Um, the employment tribunal um, between Rafiq and the club has been settled. Uh, there's no non-disclosure agreement Um which Yorkshire uh, had previously insisted upon. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Rafiq himself said afterwards that he kind of now has hope that, he, that they'll see change at the club. Um, so there was also the announcement of an independent whistleblowing hotline. Um, and look, most importantly with Lord Patel, and this is just the impression I had watching him in that press conference and what I got when I interviewed him last year. Um, I interviewed him last year um, when I was trying to get an understanding of the you know, what was happening at Yorkshire with, with British Asian players, how were Yorkshire kind of looking to, you know, target those communities. And um, the impression I got then as well is that he's just, um, he's a good man. 
<laughs> and that kind of matters. It's it, it really does. Um, and he's look, he's got a lot on his plate. Um, and the other thing he kind of made clear is that he'd just been there a couple of days. He needs to talk to everyone. He needs to. He hadn't really gone in depth with the report. Um, he needs to see everything and then make about you know his judgments. He couldn't just straight off the bat say that everything was a mess. He had to really actually have a look at everything. Um, and yeah, it just felt yesterday felt like a, a, a step forward, really. Mm. Um, Joe, what did you make of the ECB statement on Thursday evening saying that they, <coughs> at the moment at least, are, are banning Yorkshire from hosting, suspending Yorkshire from hosting international cricket? Um, yeah, it's interesting. It was, it was hard. We, uh, you guys listened to last week on the show wondering what action might come down. It was quite hard to work out what they could do because I don't like point penalties doesn't really cut it and it's probably hurting the wrong people really. Uh, and I hadn't thought of this, but actually now they've delivered it, it seems a kind of blindingly obvious way to go and I, I think it's a good way to go. Um, it's interesting, I can't remember exactly the wording, but that they don't get games back until they can prove that they've made progress. That, that That's quite... That's quite vague. What 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 will they have to do to show that they've made progress? Who's going to say that they have? That will be interesting to see how that develops and and how that can be done. Certainly, Lord Patel's appointment is going to be a massive tick in the box for that immediately. Um, but just the and I completely agree with everything that Tar said on on yesterday's press conference, which I only saw the highlights from. But the action is yet to come from from Lord Patel himself and that he's only just into the job but the tone of the whole thing the kind of the contrition it just there must have been so many people at Yorkshire watching that yesterday thinking why oh why didn't we deal with this in that way initially but mud sticks they were going to go they were going to have the reputation was going to be tarnished it would have been terrible for them either way but what's happened is so so much worse for them and I, and I hope there are lots of people looking at thinking why did we try and bury this why didn't we face up to this and deal with it they wouldn't have lost all the sponsors um they wouldn't have appeared on the front pages of newspapers they might have appeared on the back pages but they wouldn't have appeared on the front and it's just an absolute lesson it's a master class in how not to handle a situation like this and, and it's it's there is satisfaction to be had to see that actually handling it so badly has caused them these things and actually now that they are starting to handle it a little better hopefully things will start to look up for them and, and it and it can be a a, a start of something but Mo and Ali was interviewed yesterday, I mean, ahead of the T20 World Cup semi-final, but was, as you'd expect, asked about this. And he said he wasn't surprised by the by what had happened at Yorkshire. He wasn't surprised that it happened around county cricket, although he did say he hadn't experienced um, uh, racial discrimination himself. Um, but Mo and Ali also referenced Ollie Robinson, which I thought was interesting, as an example of someone who said horrific things or tweeted horrific things in his case, but an apology, forced or not, ended up coming out and he has been given a second chance effectively and there will be people that don't forgive him and obviously that is their right and absolutely understandable given the language he used but a lot of people are willing to, to at least give him a second chance and Yorkshire could have had had a similar thing here if they'd dealt with this in a properly proper way and not had their instinct was one of being defensive as opposed to how do we fix this um yeah and it's come back to bite them in in as an emphatic way as it possibly could and yeah, as I say, hopefully now other counties will look at the way that Yorkshire have handled this and, and I think there probably will be things that come up over the next weeks and months and they need to look at what Yorkshire did and, and say, well, we need to actually be open, admit the mistakes have been made and, and, and yeah, and that's the only way you can fix these things. Mm. Um, Tar, you, you've been pretty much as, as close to this story from the very beginning as anyone has. Like you, were, you were on the BBC the other day. Um what, what do you think that, that progress at Yorkshire should look like? What, what should the ECB be looking at for examples of progress at Yorkshire? I mean, we talked about it last week. It's not as if racism only exists in cricket. It's not as if racism only exists in Yorkshire cricket. But what's made Yorkshire stand out is their appalling handling of the situation. What would you like to see as someone who's seen their mishandling from the very start? Um like, like Joe said, that that was quite vague, and you don't really know what the actual specific requirements are for Yorkshire to, mm -hmm. to get international cricket again. Um, and look, a lot of things are things that you can't really see in the short term. Like there, there'll be long term things where, you know, one thing I guess we need to see is more British Asian players come through that system at Yorkshire, and that's not going to happen in the next few months. It's about having them come through at a young age and then eventually see them progress into the first team. 
And so I don't really know exactly what it is in the short term. I think the move yesterday for that um, that was announced about the the whistleblowing hotline was was a really good one and kind of like a you know Lord Patel was almost kind of inviting people to say look let's let's get it all out there let's just you know let's face up to everything that's happened um, and that was that was kind of that was that was the perfect first move really I don't really know about the next few moves I think the the things that I'm looking at are very much long term in terms of trying to really engage with with South Asian communities and look Yorkshire were doing this you know before this last year I I kind of saw it and and wrote about it and they had projects like the Brad, Bradford Park Avenue project where you know they're helping regenerate this this first class ground which is sort of in the heart of you know South Asian communities there and Lord Patel spoke to me about this and he was so enthused by that project and I imagine he's going to press forward on that project but that was just one thing it's just so much else that needs to be done so much trust that has to sort of be won back um look I, it's so it's so hard to say what what comes next well you know this the way this story's progresses you don't really know what what is going to come next one th- i mean rafiq has, has said himself that this is not really about individuals but martin moxon's position looks untenable to me I, having presided over this culture even if there aren't specific quotes attributed to him in the way they have with balance and and uh, michael vaughan it's hard to see how he can possibly continue in that role and even if he hasn't said those things himself he is he, he has at, at best allowed that culture to to exist and that is enough for him to to go and i'm i'm surprised he hasn't resigned yet um, because I think he will be pushed eventually. Um, I think that's certainly one thing that will need to happen for it to feel like a fresh start. You mm. can't have the same director of cricket. Mm, absolutely. And, and to, on Rafiq as well, uh, just an incredible thing for, for one man to be able to do to, 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 to hopefully change the entire feel of, of one of the, the, the biggest counties, the biggest cricket clubs in England. Um, he's he's got, had so much stick over the past eighteen months, and he's persevered through all of that, and he's come out on the other side, and it looks like we we are going to get some progress. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think he's just a guy who's had a sort of remarkable life. Um, you know, he you know he was you know born in Pakistan, he came to this country as a ten year old, I think, um, and progressed to become you know England under 19s captain and, and captain. You know, some of the greatest cricketers this country's ever produced um and you would have thought that his you know his life would be defined by what he'd done on the pitch but i guess now it's going to be defined by what he's done what he's done off the field uh really so he has you know he's what 30 years old and you know in an in an ideal world really we would be talking about azareem rafiq and what he'd done as a cricketer on the pitch because he was a very talented cricketer um do you think there's any chance at all? When you say his age, it's like, well, he could play for another 10 years if he was if he was still in the mix. Is there any suggestion at all I, that he might want to play again? Or? I, I honestly don't know. No. I remember when we first spoke, he was looking back, kind of looking towards trying to play professional cricket again. Um, but I think he's since said as well. I think he said, when he spoke to Crick Info last year, I think he said he knew, he kind of knew that his chances were were, were gone. Um, I, I honestly don't know. Mm. Um, obviously, there's still a lot coming out, and we'll do our best to cover the developments as thoroughly as we possibly can in the upcoming weeks. Um, Joe, what's your moment of the week? So my moment of the week uh, is tied in with COP26. There was a nice story that I saw on the BBC um, related to Glamorgan's Joe Cook, who, not content with dominating the Royal London One Day Cup, he is now uh, doing his bit to save the planet. He is... Um, so he's been volunteering at Friends of the Earth in Wales for the last few years uh, and has been campaigning for supermarkets to put doors on their fridges. Uh, and it's estimated the UK could cut its total electricity usage by 1% if the top five British supermarkets did this. Um, which is mad. Which is mad. It is mad. <laughs> I mean, that is we talk about small things having a big impact. That yeah. seems like a good place to start. Yeah. Uh, and Joe's been having some success. Um, Audi and Co-op have already agreed to do so, to, to put doors on their fridges and they reckon it will reduce their stores energy consumption by 20 percent uh, as they have agreed to trial them uh, i'm going to name and shame the other ones tesco sainsbury's morrison's waitrose and mns are still keeping their fridges doorless uh, because they think people are less likely to buy the products if they have 
doors, which doesn't suggest you think much of your customers yeah. if they, they can't manage to open a door to yeah. get. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever not bought something yeah. because there's a door in the way. Maybe it's it works on a subconscious. I guess level. they've done some research, really, yeah. but it sounds yeah. Either way, it feels like one of those things that they're digging their heels in now, and in a year's time, everyone will be like, "Well, that was a bit stupid, wasn't it?" Because they they've caught up. But. If I need some milk, I'm not going to be like, oh, "Yeah, there's a door there." So <laughs> I'll, I'll just go around the corner to I'll the, uh, yeah. the news agents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've <laughs> never <laughs> said no to a, to, to a carton of Tropicana <laughs> because of the door in the way. Um, Other orange juices are available. Yeah, yeah, true, yes. true. That is a uh, that, that is excellent though. Uh, well, well done, Joe Cook. Well, yeah, I mean, I interviewed him a couple of uh, months back, and he's a really interesting character. We talked about. He did his dissertation on how climate change is going to affect cricket in the long run, which you know affects us all, um, and. We are planning on doing something on climate change in, in the magazine in the next couple of issues. Um, I mean, it really should have been this month, to be honest, but we've not got that sorted. Uh, and Joe said he's keen to work with us as well, which would be exciting to, to, to do that. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, and on the magazine, there's a new Wisdom Cricket Monthly out this week, number 50. What's in it? Number 50. So it's an Ashes special, such as the calendar that we're doing our Ashes special whilst England are a World Cup semi-final. Yes. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit tricky to balance everything at the moment. Um, yeah, I actually wrote some stuff this time because I always forget what I'm going to the magazine. <laughs> so I put some notes. So we've got Phil's interview of Hamid, which I think he might have mentioned yeah, in passing. I think last, that's all we need. Last week. <laughs> yeah. uh, Taha's po- profiled Cameron Green, sort of Australia's all rounder in waiting, who will, I mean, he's got a big rub with the bat in this yeah. series, but the bowling is quite an interesting kind yeah. of add on. Who you might even argue really doesn't even merit all round status right now. Um, just because of what he's gone through injuries wise, he, you know, he didn't, you know, he, he his his workload was completely managed last last season. Um, there was a time where he was just playing as a specialist batter for Western Australia. I mean, he still hasn't taken a test wicket after four matches. Um, but I talked to his uh, bowling coach at Western Australia, um, and you know, he had this kind of incredible start to his first class career where he started off as a bowler, and he's a guy who's, you know, six foot six, six foot seven. Um, bowled 90 miles an hour you know could get that bounce had an outswinger and so he was he was going to be like the next fast bowling thing and now he's you know now he's the next you know he's the next great Australia batter I mean that's what Greg Chappell was kind of was kind of saying last year um so quite interesting if they can kind of get everything to work because Australia have not really had you know a great test all rounder for for decades for generations um so yeah, so yeah, he'll he'll bat a six in this series and and do a bit of bowling. I don't think we're expecting him to make massive inroads. Well, that's I've just cursed at us there. Haven't we? <laughs> Cameron Green player this yeah. series twenty five wickets Mitchell Johnson, so, yeah. <laughs> and he bats. Brilliant. Um, one of my favourite bits of the magazine. We went to Crickviz and we asked them to essentially examine the accepted truths of how to win in Australia. Um, so. Uh, Ben Jones took the lead on this one and looked at things like you need a leg spinner to win in Australia, pace is everything, and kind of dug through the stats of, of the last few visits over there, not from England, not just from England, but from all countries, to essentially say whether these things are true or not. And it's a really interesting read and threw up a few things that certainly surprised me. Um, so that's definitely worth checking out. We obviously revisited some Ashes tour disasters that England had gone on previously because. The rest of the thing was a bit too optimistic. Yeah. We had to have a bit of a dose of reality in there. Did you have enough pages? <laughs> <laughs> we never do, Yaz. We never do. Um, so that's the Ashes stuff. Another couple of bits that I'll pick out. Um, really nice. So Isha Guha is obviously known for her broadcasting and commentary. Um, she's also keen to do a bit more writing and sits on our editorial boards. And she said to us she wanted to interview Catherine Brunt, who she used to share the new ball with many moons ago for England. And it's a really lovely interview and it's another really good example of um, when basically she got stuff from Catherine that any of us in this room would not have done because they've got that personal relationship and they could reminisce and I think Catherine's pretty open at, at, the, at the best of times but was particularly so of Isha and it was a really, really lovely piece and I'm really glad we commissioned it and hopefully Isha will be doing a few more bits and pieces for us over the next few months. Um John Stern revisited England's 2001 tour of India, which was kind of set against the backdrop of 9-11. Would England go? Who was going to go? And uh, Craig White's only Test 100. An amazing quote from White on this. <laughs> yeah, so John interviewed Craig White for it. And Craig White, he's, he's a really, like, he's very chilled, uh, laid back bloke. And recalled watching the highlights of him reaching what proved to be his only Test 100. 
And uh, Bob Willis was on commentary and said, Craig White brings up his Test 100. I never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> Which <laughs> Craig White said something along the lines of, that's my big day and Bobby's pissed on my bonfire, I think was the line, which he obviously Amazing. absolutely had. Uh, Jim Wallace interviews Phil Tufnell, which is kind of predictably uh, all over the shop in a very good way. Um, that's because of Phil, not Jim, I should add. That's uh, <laughs> uh, Columnist-wise, we've got the, the usuals, Andy Zaltzman, Lawrence Booth, Andrew Miller, uh, Adam Collins on James Patterson's retirement um premature international retirement and he says he he'll be missed this uh if, it, if what basically one of australia's quicks goes down pattinson's absence will be will be sorely felt and a really interesting guest column from suresh menon our india correspondent correspondent on india pakistan and the rivalry and the whether there's any likelihood of them playing bilateral series yeah. anytime no in short was what he said but he kind of explores the rivalry and the impact that cricket matches have on society in general in india and pakistan really Really, really interesting stuff. Mm. Um, and the half centuries. And the half centuries is the, yeah. So this was obviously to mark our 50th issue. We picked out the great half centuries. Initially, it was meant to be 50 great half centuries because that would be neat. But Phil's never been great at sticking to a word count. So we ended up with 40 of them. Uh, so we've got we've got 20 kind of, we called them the immortals, just half centuries that stand in their own right. Then a selection of Ashes half centuries, a selection of World Cup half centuries, and a selection of rear guard half centuries and a couple of night watchman knocks in there as well um so i asked for some suggestions on twitter to talk about on the podcast i realized i should have asked them before i did the feature because <laughs> there are a couple some great great ones, really good yeah, yeah the one that's really hurt me is uh aravinda de silva's 66 in the 1996 world cup semi-final v india which did not make it in uh because we didn't think of it to be honest. And the person who suggested it as well, that will be in the list, I am sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and Aravinda, Sorry, Wajdi. <laughs> I know. And he was one of my cricketing heroes as well, so that one hurts. If we had our time again, uh, Aravinda would be there, I promise. Um, Santoki from the Caribbean Cricket Podcast picked out Shane Shillingford's 29 ball, 53, batting at 11 in a test match West Indies, which I don't remember watching live, but I, that sounds amazing. I looked at that one, we did consider it i think we discounted it because it came in a, i think last innings of a big last defeat. innings yeah. of a big defeat so it was kind of fun but not necessarily that significant yeah i do think you forgetting um aravinda de silva's you know half century of the world cup same final kind of it's symbolic in a way of <laughs> of the half century as a thing because you know what you will think of is de silva's hundred in in the world cup exactly. final right you're always going to forget point. you're always going to forget the half centuries and that's why this feature is a very lovely thing, Jim. It, it's also hard to research <laughs> as well because you can get up just yeah. list of hundreds and there aren't that many. But to go over half centuries, it is just... Mm. It, so it really has to be on instinct and what you can remember. Yeah. And obviously we asked people and you guys gave us suggestions. But there's a lot of love out there for Alex Tudor's 99 Not Out, which yeah. I'm pleased they <laughs> did make the cut. Good. Several votes for Sachin's 98 v Shoaib in Pakistan at Centurion in 2003, which most definitely made the cut. Uh, ben Stokes, 2019 World Cup final. Obviously that's in... And uh, a bit more left field, Mike Goose Tainton suggested Glenn Collins of West Malvern CC for an expletive laden 53 last summer, <laughs> which play. I'm sorry to say did not make the cut, Fair unfortunately, play. but I am intrigued by the innings. Um, um, yeah, so that's th do check that out and um, do tell us all the innings that I've missed <laughs> or that me and Phil have missed. A um, um, lot of love for James Vince 83, the greatest what if in sporting history. Well, there um, was also, <laughs> but also the, the Perth knock. I think the one that, which one? Because Ben Jones suggested one. I think that might have been even the Perth, where he yeah. just breezed his way to 55, which John Hotton had also suggested. We've just used it too many times in the mag. Yes. <laughs> so it, it didn't make the cut. The other one that I thought, I, 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 I agree with Ty, it's quite hard to remember great 50s in a way. So I think I have a big time recency bias here, but Sam Curran's 60-odd against India at Edge Bastard in that really close test match. Um Sam Khan was, st was still a pretty strange pick at the time and kind of announced himself <coughs> as, a, as a player of note in, in a pretty emphatic way. I remember yeah. his um, six over extra cover coming down the wicket to Ishan yes. Sharma. Yeah, yeah. It's a shot I think I'll never forget. Um, it, yeah. was hard to, it was hard to think of many that weren't recent. You know, yeah, it was kind of... You know what I mean? Yeah, with centuries. I mean, they could be 10, 15 years ago and they'll still stick in your mind. For me, it was even, even knocks that that's slightly unlucky to, to miss out. I mean, I was also kind of thinking about the 30s and 40s that you always kind of remember. Um, so one, one knock I'm always a big fan of, but no one ever talks about um, is Johnny Bairstow's 30-something at Headingley in the, in the Stokes-Headingley Stokes game. Yeah. 
because it's the kind of perfect short knock where it's it kind of changes the mood of the match and isn't the the headline grabber but has done kind of sets up the headline basically well maybe that's the next one 50 great 30s <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> you can do the research for that one <laughs> Um, that well you can get the magazine as always at wisdom.com forward slash shop that is all we have time for thanks to our thanks Joe if you enjoyed the show um, please do leave us a five star review on the podcast that bit helps send the podcast to new listeners Um, but otherwise we'll be back not only next week but later this week after the second final of the T20 second semi-final of the T20 World Cup cheers